There we go. Go ahead. Once again, thank you all very much for being here today. It is such a great pleasure to welcome you back. My name is Joshua Tucker. I am the director of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia, professor here in the politics department. It's great to see all of you here today. Before we get started, I just want to give a huge shout out to Sasha Spitalnik, who is our uh, program, yay, who makes all of this possible, all of this happen. Um, and, and, if, Kyle. and yeah, and Kyle, who's outside of the door as well, helping out. Uh, it's great to see so many people in the Jordan Center during the time of the pandemic when we had nobody here. This is what kind of kept us going, thinking about events like this where we would have all of us back here together today. Um, I do want to encourage those of you who, if this is your first time here, uh, you know, send us your email address so that we can get you can get on our list. We have lots of great events. We have many more great events coming in this series as well. Uh, but so for those of you who are new to the Jordan Center, you know, we're back in business. As you can see, everybody's here. We also, as you can tell by the cameras, we also do everything on hybrid. So if you aren't here and you want to attend any of our events, you can do it live on time in hybrid. And you can also check out the YouTube videos uh, afterwards. And in particular, the YouTube videos from this series are available right after uh, the talks are over. So it is with great pleasure. Uh, that I introduce once again, Yevgenia Albats, our distinguished journalist in residence here at the Jordan Center for the year, as she continues this amazing and wonderful series that she's put together on conversations with Yevgenia Albats. Uh, she has, I have discovered, uh, as I've always suspected and always known, that Yevgenia has the, the greatest Rolodex when it comes to anything Russia related. And uh, unlike the rest of us who are like, oh, please, could you come and talk in our seminar? When Yevgenia calls, people tend to say yes. So, and, and I will let her introduce our, our so guest. They say yes, they dare not say yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, you know, I was, I was in graduate school with Yevgenia. So I learned that, I learned that a long time ago. <laughs> um, so anyway, I will let Yevgenia introduce our, our wonderful guest here today. We're super happy to have him here. I am incredible. I've been looking, I've looked forward. All these conversations have been wonderful. I'm especially looking forward to the conversation today. So without further ado, please uh, join me in thanking David Remnick and Yevgeny Albats. Yevgeny will introduce David. Josh, thank you very much. And thank you very much to the Jordan Center and to the New York University for give, providing me with a shelter and for giving me this excellent office and opportunity. An opportunity uh, uh, to do what I do. You know, I keep doing my shows uh, for Russian audience, and of course, you know, this conversation, uh, these conversations with uh, we we had, you know, Peter Baker and Susan Glaser of the New York, of course, and uh, we had uh, last time we had uh, uh, Professor Angel Stent of Georgetown University. She was absolutely. Uh, excellent. So anyway, and I'm uh, honored to introduce today to you uh, David Remnick, uh, the editor-in-chief, of course, you know, of the New Yorker, and that's the latest issue that I got just yesterday. I religious, I've been religiously reading New York and uh, since mid-1990s. Uh, David became the staff writer for the New Yorker in 1992, and, uh, he, was, and he became the editor-in-chief 1996, right? Eight, 1998, sorry. So I, I've been a subscriber to the New Yorker and for some time it was even delivered to me in Moscow on paper all the way until 2014. And then they cut off, of course, you know, all that. But never mind, you know, uh, I kept reading it on my iPhone. They have excellent app. Anyway, but of course, you know, the most, you know, they have amazing uh, feature stories. Um, David and I, we know each other for the last probably 33 or 34 years. I was trying to figure out something like that. Uh, we, we got acquainted shortly after David became a Washington Post correspondent in Moscow. And these were the golden years of uh, the Russian journalism and of probably of the Russian history. Uh, it was when Perestroika and Glasnost just happened, thanks to this guy. Uh, <laughs> thanks to this guy, to Mikhail Gorbachev, who passed the day, passed away the day I landed in New York City on August 30th, 2022. Uh, these golden years are reflected in the Remnick's masterpiece, uh, his Pulitzer Prize winning. Letting Stone, The Last Days of the Soviet Empire, 
Since then, David has written six books with an amazing variety of topics from another book on Russia. It's called A Resurrection, The Struggle for New Russia to biography of Muhammad Ali and the 44th president of the United States, Barack Obama, and also the collection of his uh, uh, essays and you know, feature stories that he uh, keeps publishing in New York. It, it's amazing because you know I know what it's like to be an editor because I was myself an editor. And I know that it's extremely time consuming job and it consumes your brains and mind and your life and everything. So I'm, I'm just stunned that you keep writing uh, at the same speed as you did. So thank you very much for doing this. And before I ask my question, let me tell you that um, the idea is that I try to wrap uh, our interview in 45, 50 minutes, and then we'll go to the questions from the audience and alternate with questions from Zoom. Uh, be aware this conversation uh, will be recorded. We will download it on the Jordan Center YouTube channel and on the New Times uh, YouTube channel as well. So those who failed, to, you know, didn't have time to come today, you know, that you can uh, watch it later. With your permission, David, um, I will translate this interview into Russian, if you don't mind. And I will put it on the New Times website. Of course, it's blocked, but, you know, still, you know, this uh, more, more than one million people left Russia since uh, February 24, when Putin started the war with Ukraine. One million two hundred thousand, you know, the estimate. So, and this is huge diaspora, so they can uh, read New Times regardless uh, of all these blocking and uh, exercises of the Russian government. So, yeah, so if you don't mind, you know, I will do this. Okay, so let's start. Uh, would you want to, me to start with good news or bad news? <laughs> okay. Okay. Then, you know, Russian propaganda networks and its commentators are outraged with the outcomes of the midterms. Yeah. They expected a red wave, which was a very, which was the sort of way of calling it out of uh, Mara Laga. But it didn't happen. No. David, what? Why it didn't happen? Why did you so upset uh, my guys back home? <laughs> Before I answer that question, I, I, I want to say what you already know that Gina Albas is uh, an absolute treasure. We were very lucky to have her here. I think she, I think we all know that she's of mixed emotions about being here. Who, who wants to be home like anybody wants to be? And, and, Virginia, above all, wants to be in the thick of the action where she is going to be. And um, so it's, it's doubly an honor and a privilege to, have, to be with you today. I really appreciate the invitation. And it's not that I wouldn't dare accept it. I would always accept it. What happened at the midterms? It would be absolute nonsense to say that I or anyone else predicted this, or those who did predict it, were guessing. I mean, the margins, we should, we should remember. The margins of victory are like this. So on the one hand, if the margins of victory had gone one way, it would have been authoritarianism. And if it's gone the other way, it's a great victory for democracy. The fact of the matter is we're an extremely polarized, polarized country. I'm and so sorry, David. We're having some audio issues on Zoom. So I'm just going to turn up your microphone. Turn it up. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, you can leave that on. Can I keep going? Start again. Back in. In Russian. <laughs> 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 yeah, yes, exactly. A couple of words. President Putin himself. Yeah. <laughs> sitting here at you know the, the red hot center of, of a blue state and a blue city and a undoubtedly blue university for the most part I'm sure um, one need only doesn't you don't have to travel to rural Denver or Alabama all you have to do is go an, an hour outside of the city or to Long Island and an entirely different political psychology prevails I do think Virginia the one clear thing one clear loser of the election is um, Donald Trump. 
Oh, absolutely. Why am I not that much upset? Well, you'll live. Um, <laughs> and so Trump himself as an individual seems to lost. There was a, the New York Post, we should not get our flowers and candy um, for this, but it's very clear that Rupert Murdoch has turned on uh, Donald Trump after six years of you know, full-throated support. I noticed that the morning after the midterm elections, Look, where's Trump? Where's where are the elections? There it is. Florida man makes announcement. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, you know, God forbid that I credit Rupert Murdoch for his staff with, it, with any wit, but that's, that's pretty bad. Right. <laughs> and then on the inside page, there was just one small column as if some clown had lost a city council race <laughs> in, you know, in a suburb somewhere. Oh. It was quite brilliant. On the other hand, the Wall Street Journal covered it this, in an expected way, which was uh, full, full throated. I, I really, so that's Trump. And his speech felt, you know, uh, like old times, and people were tired of it. And even in Mar a Lago, people were trying to get out of the room. They had to block the door to, to not let people out the back of Mar a Lago. That's why Ivanka Trump never made it to the room. Ivanka Trump never went in the first place. But again, you know, bully for her. She was right next to him for four years. And, okay. The question is, has Trumpism dissipated? That, that what has been normalized in the country as so-called conservative politics is very different than the conservative politics that I grew up on, and you grew up on, and even the students here grew up on. That has radically transformed into a uh, neo-authoritarian uh, set of policies, psychologies, attitude toward the truth, style, language, people's, what people say to each other, how they say it, the way we behave politically is deeply influenced by Trumpism. So when you hear about Ron DeSantis, uh, the ascent of Ron DeSantis, or, or many others, by the way, I'm not absolutely sure that they'll be a candidate, and I'm not sure that Trump will lose either. I don't want to be quoted saying that Trump has no chance. Never count that guy out. It's like, you know, it's a Bram Stoker story. <laughs> the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that Santos is deeply influenced by Trumpism. The way he talks about people who are his political opponents is positively Trumpist. Um, so the influence of what happened, uh, it shouldn't displease Vladimir Vladimir too much because uh, it has distorted our politics, our political rhetoric, the way we behave with each other, and policy, I think, for many years to come. So I, I wouldn't, yes, it was better, from my point of view, from my political point of view, that what happened happened, as opposed to a red wave. But we shouldn't suddenly think it's, you know, 2008 in Grant Park, uh, all over again. New Grant Park, Chicago. Exactly, where Obama uh, stood for celebrations with him. Uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump did announce that they are going to run in 2024. Are we really going to see a run of two not that young as men? Well, I, I correct Sorry, I'm Trump. sorry to interrupt you again. David, can we have you use the handle microphone, please? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Just pass it back and forth? Yes. 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 Let's just do that. How about that? Has, are you happy with that? That's perfect. Okay. Thanks very much. I just, I would just dare to correct you slightly. Joe Biden has said he will decide in the beginning of the year and he intends to run. He's left himself a kind of wormhole to crawl through if he needs to. I, look, I, I think it passes no one's notice that Joe Biden is not a 50 year old man. And, you know, you can see it physically, you can see it sometimes, you know, in the mistakes he makes. I think there's probably more attention to that paid by the media than ordinary people. I think, rightly or wrongly, I think a lot of ordinary people think, yeah, I, I forget names somehow too. And it, it's kind of relatable, you know, for especially for all, us older people um, who forget a name or two or don't, don't hear or whatever it is. Nevertheless, I'd be lying if I thought it was a political advantage to be 80 years old and running for a second term at the age of 82. So, I, I, you know, even if he does run, I would not be surprised if there were a um, uh, opposition in the Democratic Party, uh, not necessarily from the left, but across the range. And you have people like Gretchen Whitmer, 
in Michigan, Amy Klobuchar, um, feel, feel free to fill in the names that you like, but I don't think it's an open and shut case that if Joe Biden runs, that he has the nomination. I, I feel about the, you know, in terms of Joe Biden, do I, uh, you know, two cheers for Joe Biden in a sense. Um, I think particularly where Ukraine is concerned, I, he's managed to pull off an incredible uh, diplomatic subtlety at the highest level, which is to say full-throated support for a just cause in Ukraine, uh, just the right amount of military support and coordination throughout NATO, and the result has been astonishing. First and foremost, bravo to the Ukrainian effort and their bravery and unity. Um, and also a lot has been revealed about the Russian military and its corruption and disorganization and disintegration. But I think also Biden has managed to pass some legislation that <laughs> had other presidents passed it, but he would get extraordinary credit for. It's just that when you have an inflation rate that ranges between 9% and 7%, it obliterates so much for so many people and for, for just, you know, for, for reasons that one can understand. It's very hard to win a political race with inflation at that level, and yet the Democrats did. It says a lot about possibly where we are with the Republican Party. And I think Republicans know it. But what did happen or has happened to the American political system? You have a country with a population of uh, almost 33 million people. 332, I believe, almost something like that. And time and again, we end up with two names, Trump and Biden. Before that, there were also, you know, there was Clinton, Hillary Clinton, before that. But anyway, you know, it's, 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 it's very strange, especially to me. Yeah. Well. Uh, you mean in terms of in, in terms of age? I think what Mosh, I, I think what Jen is referring to is in the in the late seventies, you looked around at the Soviet political system, and nobody was under the age of seventy five. And, and yes, and of course, you know the the, the, the way of the, the, the uh, stomachs in, uh, affected greatly, uh, largely uh, Russian, Soviet foreign and domestic politics, right? <laughs> Uh, but look, I, we have a two-party system. We don't. We don't have a, a. You know, it's not the Israeli system where you have fifteen parties or whatever it is, and then coalitions. And the, we have a two-party system, and we're also, whether we like it or not, uh, it is very hard to imagine in the current United States a Democrat on the left, left, winning a nomination and then a general election. I mean, people in this room, maybe some people in this city. Uh, might vote for it, but that's not the country we we live in. Um, and it would it, even Barack Obama, who we now a lot of people, I would guess, in this room, look back to with a lot of um, good feeling, uh, even nostalgia, um, and not only about his intelligence, but about his politics. He was not on the left left. The most radical thing about Barack Obama was his identity. The fact that he was a black man who for the first time in American history won that <coughs> office. That was the most radical thing about him. And historically, that will be the first paragraph in his uh, obituary, may it come many, many, many years down the line. Um, so I, it's not surprising to me that uh, the, the Democrats, in order to win a general election, uh, vote toward the center or center left. That has been axiomatic for, for a very long time. As far as younger politicians are concerned, no, Gretchen Whitmer is not an unflawed candidate, but she's not old. Amy Klobuchar is not old. Uh, Pete Buttigieg is positively young. Uh, all the people that pe the people that people name are distinctly younger than than Joe Biden. I think Bernie Sanders is not going to run for a national election, and Bernie is a year older than Biden, maybe something like that. Um, and Hillary Clinton ain't running for anything anymore. I don't expect. So I think you'll see a new generation. Um, but it, some of it depends on what doors Biden does or do not, does not open. Okay. Um, Close, uh, uh, okay. Uh, 
you mentioned, you know, that President Biden did an ama has made an amazing job in terms of supporting uh, Ukraine, you know, when we all of a sudden, you know, you and I would remember, you know, probably, you know, in the same, uh, with the same horror, you know, this day of uh, February 24th, four o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. That's when the war Nazi invaded Soviet Union. So Putin chose four o'clock in the morning to announce his war uh, against Ukraine and invasion of Russian troops uh, in Ukraine. Was you, were you shocked, surprised? Did you expect this to happen? By that time, no. I think it's very hard to imagine Putin sending, how many was it, 150,000 troops, tanks, all of it, and surrounding, and then not doing anything, or doing something very slight or minor. What would be, what would he be, what was the point? I think, I think we all know that the, what the plan was. The plan was to send an intimidating and overwhelming, seemingly overwhelming force to the Ukrainian border and have quick strikes and assassination teams and come in and so-called take Kiev and take certain cities at their leadership level. And in his mind, uh, Ukraine would collapse. Uh, Zelensky would end up either dead or uh, across the border in Russia. And uh, collaborators would seize the day and a, and, a, and a passive Ukrainian people would throw in their lot with Russia. That, that was the plan. The plan failed miserably, thanks to the, I, I, I think not only to the bravery of the Ukrainian people and the high organization of its, uh, of its, of its military and its intelligence forces, but it's, its deep cooperation with the United States and NATO. I think that it was essential, especially after those first days where Kiev was not taken. And then the other thing that we're seeing more and more evidence of and learning more and more about is the utter failure of the Russian military. Zhenya, for the last, I don't know how many years, I've been reading articles in the Russian press and, and also the analytic Western press about the, in, the, the revived Russian military, its, its, its multiplicity of strategies, its sophistication, it's, um, uh, who's the general that's supposed to be the mastermind of, of, of new kinds of, of military strategy. It was me meant to be thoroughly revived upon the ashes of the, of the much beleaguered 90s and aughts. And yet we see the Russian military in real time failing horribly, despite outnumbering Ukraine and Ukrainian forces. Um, its intelligence failures are spectacular. Its weapons uh, seem not to work. Its generals are picked <coughs> off one by one by 10 by, by it's astonishing. Um, you see um, an entire military that doesn't know why it's there. So therefore it's unmotivated, disorganized, asked to do things that are, are just beyond horrible and they know it. And of course they do it, a lot of them, and therefore you have things like Bucha and all kinds of strategies, but an utterly psychologically, strategically demoralized Russian military. And then when Putin had to go back under pressure from forces around him to call up even more <coughs> soldiers, the, it was an utter failure, that effort. It, there, were, there were protests, mostly local protests. Um, and at the same time, the, there's a class element to what's going on in Russia. Like, my guess is, Jenny, your friends who are still in Russia, their sons at age 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22 have either left the country or have not been called up into the military and have made themselves scarce. I'm sure that's the case in Moscow, St. Petersburg. On the other hand, if you lived in Makhachkala or whatever provincial, Odessa. they're Odessa. scooping Odessa. them Odessa. everywhere. They're scooping them off the streets as cannon fodder and they're coming back in boxes. How are mothers, 
a, a, and, and fathers uh, uh, treating this horrific tragedy. And for what reason? Also, I, I watch for, as a form of self-punishment, various Russian talk shows, Solovyov, Kisilyov, Itak Dalia. And in the beginning of the war, for at least six months, it was full-throated, absolute support. If there was one slight word of disagreement, we all knew about it because it was exceptional. Now you hear all the time. Now you, the, the, le the level of frustration on the pro-militarist right is, is, is loud. People like Kadyrov um, and other people in the inner circle have allowed themselves to criticize Putin. This is not Putin. Uh -uh. David, not Putin. They allow to criticize the, uh, or the, the effort, the effort. Okay, so who else is they direct? It, it, and that's a that's a, a what we call a, um, uh, it, it's without a difference. It, in, in essence, they're, they've allowed themselves to criticize what they would not have done six months ago. So I think, you know, there's a, a certain amount of chaos. And if you ask people who know uh, or think they know what's going on. I think the Russian leadership doesn't know what they're going to do from day to day to day, that there's no master plan anymore. There's just a sense of trying to get by day to day and it's a disaster and everybody knows it. Today's news. Russian forces have carried- Yeah, they're coming. <laughs> Russian forces have carried out rocket and artillery attacks all across Ukraine from Kherson and Mykolaiv in the south to Lugansk and Kharkiv in the northeast. There had been 25 missile strikes and civilian infrastructure was hit in six regions. Yeah. 23 people were injured in missile strikes in Dnipro and several people were killed in Zaporozhye. Russian cruise missile attacked Ukrainian power grid. Much of the country sporadically is cut off from electricity. Uh, there are problems with heat and sanitation and it is freezing temperature in Kyiv, minus two centigrade today. How, and we watch this day after day and the entire world and in the democratic Western world is watching how Putin is destroying Ukraine, just tearing it into pieces and nothing happens. He keeps doing this. He has his hands untied and Ukrainians, you know, this amazing resilience that they demonstrate, uh, they are the only, you know, who are trying to, to resist. Yes, with the help of the uh, American weapons, uh, with the help of the European uh, weapons, but still the entire Western civilization is watching what we once said, never again. And it happens again and again and again. And here I should say what I say each time when we talk about this awful war that my country and I'm citizen of the Russian Federation conducts against Ukraine. I am ashamed of what is going on. It is, I've never could imagine in my life that my country uh, is going to bomb my another country because my grandmother uh, grew up in Ukraine as grandmothers and grandparents and parents of uh, 11 million Russians who have first degree relatives uh, who live in uh, and you too. You're from where? Which part? Here. And mine from Dirash. Okay, it's, it's uh, close to Khmelnytsky. Anyway, so my question is how long it can go like that? Are we going to watch and see how Putin destroys the entire, the, uh, destroys Ukraine? Evidently, evidently. Oh. I, 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 I forgot to say when I was praising Biden in the, in the beginning of this, the key element of the strategy was both positive and negative. Positive in the sense of, of a certain kind of political support, military support, strategic support, in, and intelligence support. The negative is the desire not to begin the Third World War, 
So the day before yesterday, we saw one missile kill two Poles in Polish territory. And we all immediately felt the, the chill of what that could portend because we've all studied World War I, how little events trip into bigger events and bigger events and then calamity. Not that the, what we have now isn't a calamity, but I mean on the grand, grand scale. So happily in, in, a, in a dark and ironic way, or at least to our relief, it is likely that that was not a, a, a Russian missile fired at Ukraine. But is Russia ultimately responsible for the whole thing? Of course, this, this was an, uh, you know, a, a, an invasion without rationale. And the only rationale that was present was Putin's completely fantastical thinking that Ukraine in its sum was not a real country. That's the entire logic. He is shocked that Ukrainian nationalism, self-possession, sense of self exists to the degree that it does. And, and, and insofar as some Ukrainians felt some sense of uh, attachment to Russia, those people have now lost it. The only success Putin has had in Ukraine is to consolidate and heighten and forever uh, uh, ensure a Ukrainian sense of nation for all Ukrainians. Those for whom it did not exist, it sure as hell exists now. That's the great irony. Thanks. Uh, do you understand, or do at least you know you, you you of course you know you thought about that. What is Putin's end game? I, I honestly think, Shen, again, the stupidest thing we can do is, is is try to read people's minds. All we can do is analyze what we see, what we read, that we can rely on, what he says, and I think quite quite frankly, take him at his word. I think that he had an end game and within days, it, 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 well, you might remember in the American experience that American forces would be greeted in Iraq with candy and flowers, right? right? And then Chalabi would be installed and democracy would reign forever and ever. That was the end game. And then what? What, what happened after that was years of horrific violence and chaos and improvisation and, and the rest. I think that's to some extent what we're seeing in, in Ukraine. There is no end game. And we constantly, I'm sure you, you know, watch the usual television shows and listen to the usual radio and experts, far more expert than, than I could be, get on and they start talking very solemnly about the new cliche, off ramps. What off ramp can we offer Vladimir Putin? I, I, you know, at this point, short of surrender or at a minimum, surrendering lands that Ukraine has no intention of surrendering in, in the Donbass, as well as consolidation of you know, Crimea and the rest, I, I, I don't see it yet. I, 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 it was a very interesting moment about, how many weeks ago was it, that some congressmen and women on, uh, on the left had a letter and it was very clumsy and it was, and unfortunately it was a kind of failure. They, it was just badly done. They'd written a letter earlier in the summer, at least listened to, to suggestions about negotiation. I understand where that comes from. It comes from the fear of thousands and thousands and thousands of more dead and endless war and digging in our... I, I get it. It was very poorly executed, in fact, so badly that it was withdrawn. Two, about a week after that, you started hearing in Peter Baker, I think made, might have written the story in the New York Times, wrote that there's actually a debate at the highest level of the government, not the left in Congress, Democratic left, but in the government about the very question that you're asking. How do you entice, draw in the seemingly uh, unseducible <laughs> uh, uh, Putin to, and as it's called, an off-ramp? What, what is, what, what is the end game, because you are right. Every day this is happening. Electricity, we worry about dams, we worry about nuclear power plants. We see thousands and thousands of human beings killed all the time. Losses are in, in the high, high, high tens of thousands on both sides, and there is no end to it. 
But I think if I'm reading the Russian leadership correctly, as well as the West, and especially the U Ukraine, I don't see negotiations of the kind we're used to, public, official, across a table with little flags. I don't see that happening for quite a while, for quite a while. We're lucky if, uh, if the American defense leadership can get the Russian defense leadership on the phone to avoid even greater disasters. Very often those phone calls are not accepted. It's very, very perilous. Yes, I'm a general, Mark Milley, chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, recently warned that, quote, the probability of a Ukrainian military victory defined as kicking the Russians out of all of Ukraine to include what they claim as Crimea, the probability of that happening anytime soon is not high, military, end of quote. And he suggested that the government in Kyiv should consider the coming winter an opportunity to negotiate an end to the conflict. This idea, land for peace, is somewhat getting more and more popular, at least you know, the way I uh, see it. Uh, Elon Musk, for one, you know, the, the, uh, the richest man on, on the face of this planet, suggested this um, several weeks ago. So how, what is your take on that? Well, the first thing I'd say is I'm glad that Elon Musk is not Secretary of State. Um, <laughs> it's bad enough that he's, owns Twitter. Um, I, I, okay. Um, well, what Millie was saying is, the, is exactly the conflict that I was, I was referring to. Um, the point is, if you are Zelensky and his leadership and the Ukrainian people, and you are witness to, not from afar, not from thousands of miles away, but in your village, people being shot in the back of the head with their hands tied behind their back, uh, people being raped, um, atrocities carried out on a daily basis, rocket fire coming in, the lights being shut off. Are you about to be the first to raise your hand in surrendering lands? Or do you dig in your heels and fight more when you know the Russians are on, on their heels to extend the metaphor? I, I, I think it's un, unreasonable to expect Ukraine anytime soon saying, you know what? We never really cared that much about Donbass or Crimea or, or, or. I just don't see that happening anytime soon. The dilemma you spell out absolutely correct, which is to say, as a result, not as a result, but the Russian actions are such that the damage is going to be horrific, despite Ukrainian successes in places like uh, Kherson and so on. It, 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 I, I wish I could give you an, a, an optimistic view, or I could give you a key to the lock. I don't have either one. And I don't think we see that in, in the short term, that's for sure. David, you know us. You spent so much time in the Soviet Union and in Russia. Time and again, you were returning back to Moscow. And we were, tell me, what he, happened to my country? Why my fellow citizens do what, I'm serious about that. It is extremely painful, you know? When they started, when Putin started this war, each morning I was waking up in Moscow and I was reading news from Ukraine and I was crying. And I know we talked with my friend, Mickey Bird with the Moscow Times, that she was crying too. And part of that, not just, you know, what this, all these horrible uh, videos that we were getting from Ukraine, but also it was horror that the people who were conducting that, committing all these atrocities, and this genocidal war in Ukraine, they are my fellow citizens. They, my, maybe not next door neighbors, but somewhere around. And people who are giving them orders to do that, they live in the same city as I am. Mr. Prigozhin, who is the owner 
of uh, Wagner uh, army, right? You know, he's from St. Peter. This is a cradle of Russian civilization. What ha did happen to Russian civilization? What did happen to this nation, which so easily after, and especially given that we survived through the World War II, we lost 27 million people to that war. We got accustomed to think about ourselves as we're the nation which, which stopped Hitler. We managed to get it all the way back to Berlin and kill this brown, uh, whatever, you know. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So what happened? Well, what happened is a 2,000 page book at, at, at minimum. And I, I, I can't possibly do it. You, you referred to when you were introducing me so kindly as having lived in Russia in a golden moment. And that's absolutely correct. It was also a fleeting moment. It was a brief moment in Russian history. Russian history is, and, and what I'm about to say is truncated to the extreme and banal as well, but a thousand years of autocracy in many ways cut off from the rest of the world. And then uh, 70 odd years of totalitarian uh, communism. And then for about 15 minutes, enormous promise. And the idea that, and at the period I refer to obviously is say March 1985 till into the 90s. And so the idea that Russia, which had accumulated an empire and saw its ruling ideology, its totalist ideology of uh, Bolshevism collapse, saw its imperial arrangements collapse. It saw its um, democratic promise turn from the possibility of uh, democratia to dirmokratia, democracy to shitocracy. To see the concept of democracy so defiled in the eyes of so many, it's a long conversation too, uh, is it, it, the, our expectations in say, 1989 to 1991 were ecstatic, ecstatic. Democracy globally was on the rise in Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Latin America, even in China, there was a democratic movement until it was crushed at Tiananmen Square. And now we see what's happening there. So the idea, and, and, and by the way, the American experience should show us that the idea that democratic liberalism much less peace is the natural state of things and everything else is an aberration, uh, to me, unfortunately speaks of a level of delusion that grownups should not take it very seriously. And so the, what we've learned in our American experience is even in this country, which was formed in large part in the most convenient geography on the globe, right? Oceans on both sides, Canada, Mexico, and formed by enlightenment philosophers in the 18th century of the highest order, although they got some things very wrong, like slavery and a few other things, there's rights of women, but at least put into, into system a democratic, liberal, uh, improvable constitution. Even here, our uh, injustices and uh, godforsaken wars abroad uh, have been, uh, well, to be studied for the rest of our, our, our days. So our expectations from 1989 to 1991 were ecstatic. They're understandable. Um, I don't regret them, um, but to, to have expected historically that it would be just a straight line to democratic liberalism uh, and prosperity and uh, comedy, comedy with uh, all the countries around you and in the, in the globe was probably a little too much to ask. That, that's a very, very, very short answer to a question that is incredibly suggestive. You know, I, I think there was another delusion, not just people in the West, like your 
circle, not actually not your circle so much, but people a little younger who followed the Putin deal. It was basically a deal from, from 2000 to 2021. And the deal was, particularly if you lived in cities and you were educated, and you would, now you're gonna, now you're gonna be able to live a middle-class life and you could go to Cyprus or visit Paris, read the books you want. If you wanna send your kids and you're lucky enough to have the money to do it, send them to NYU, great. But stay out of politics. That was the deal. And we saw that deal uh, continue. And there was, a, it was, there was this delusion. You, know, you, would, you would visit Moscow or St. Petersburg. And an increasing number of cities, you go, wow, this is different. Restaurant. I lived in Moscow from 19, beginning of 88 to the end of 91. There were no restaurants. <laughs> there were sort of shitty hotel restaurants and it would take six years to get out of there. It was like Pizza Hut and McDonald's. Oh my God, there was one McDonald's or something like that. And you know, then I'd go in the 90s, it was like, oh, there's like nightlife and style and you know, young people and people went to decent dentists all of a sudden. And there was a hospital that if you had enough money, you could go etc. There was this illusion of a cosmopolitan European life in certain cities for a certain class, many of them now gone. That deal is over. That and what I worry about um, is that for the Russian side, I worry most of all about Ukraine and lives and all the damage that's going on there, which is just beyond horrific. I worry that the repercussions of this war for Russia, for Russians, better to say, yes, Putin may die, he may be overthrown. I don't know what, I just frankly don't care because I, you know, to some extent, it's not like he's gonna get overthrown by Navalny. He, 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 the, the, the threat to him at this point is probably on the right in the short term. My concern is that Russia's isolation, its, its resentment, its um, fury will be greater than we've ever known. And that the ramifications and, and the ramifications for Russia economically, culturally, politically, and in terms of its future will long outlast even our memory of, of the war itself. And that is, that is the responsibility of and on the shoulders, I'm afraid of one person. Last week, there was a big conference of academics who study my part of the world, Eastern Europe, Eurasia, and Russia in particular. One of the sessions was titled, quote, Decolonizing and Decentering Russian Studies. It is Russian studies. It is to say that Russia's imperialistic ideology uh, I'm trying to explain what was discussed at the session, has gotten its hand over studies of the region, a region as well, and this should be changed. Basically, it comes to the question that in most of the majority of the American universities and global universities, Russian culture and Russian, uh, and you know, everything Russian was studied first and foremost. Few people really know not to say in Russia, you know, but you know, in the in the United States universities, the history of uh, Ukraine, or you know, or read, you know, the, the the history of Ukraine, and few people ask themselves why Gogol had to write his beautiful novels in Russian, though he was Ukrainian and he was writing about Ukrainian life. Right? So, what do you think? You know, but you know this. Not the universities, this whole notion of decolonizing Russian studies. Some would say that it can go as far as counseling uh, Russian culture. I can tell you it's, it's no fun to be a Russian now. Not fun at all. But what do you think about this whole notion of decolonizing of Russian studies? Well, Let's start from the real reality. The real reality is that, um, I don't know what the NYU statistics are, but I'm 64 years old. And when I was an undergraduate, 
I would say roughly 40% of the undergraduates where I went to school majored in the humanities. Now it's, I did, I was sorry, I'm, so, I'm sorry you mentioned, oh, I didn't go anywhere grad, I went to work. Um, a friend of mine who teaches at Harvard, another fancy schmancy school said that, you know, yes, it was 40 odd percent in, you know, when in the seventies or into the eighties, it is now 10%, 10%. These are wealthy universities with a lot of uh, students who have the capacity to study humanities and then maybe do something distinctly non-humanities afterwards. So my greatest academic in intellectual concern is a little less specific than your question. I worry about the humanities. I worry about people taking seriously the idea of taking a, a book, an enigmatic text that doesn't have just an ideology or a point of view or an identity and people learning to wrestle with it in a complex way. That's, a, that's something to learn in university. And I, my concern is that that has become for all kinds of economic reasons um, and other practical reasons, parent reasons, uh, all kinds of reasons has become uh, more marginalized in a, in a, in a serious way. So I'm only, if, if somebody comes to you know, NYU and comes to study with you or comes to study with you and even has the discussion you're talking about, about Russian, about Russian history as opposed to imperial history, I'm grateful that discussion is happening. I'm not, I, first of all, I'm not deep enough in this subject to engage the argument. You know, there, there are reasons Gogol wrote in Russian as opposed to Ukrainian. And there are all kinds of arguments about Ukrainian identity and vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And it, it's a very long history that we needn't uh, get into because I'm certainly not a master of it. But, but I, I, I'm concerned more with this, and maybe this is particular to the United States and it is not the case in Russia. I worry about the diminution bit by bit of humanistic study in, in, in college and universities. Uh, Returning back to our topic, major topic, the US, uh, the US uh, chief of CIA and the former US ambassador to Moscow, Bill Burns, yes, you know him, and uh, met in Ankara, Turkey, with his Russian counterpart, Vitaly Narishkin, the head of the Russian intelligence as well. Gossip has it that they negotiated a prison exchange of American prisoners sitting in Russian penal colonies for the Russian guys in the US prisons. Today, Alexei Navalny, who is in the maximum security prison, was sentenced to even tougher one, a super maximum, maximum security, or administrative maximum prison. It is a control unit prison. From now on, he's not going to be allowed any family reunion uh, uh, at all. Before that, before today's decision, he was allowed two per year. I sp uh, on purpose, I went to Green Haven, the maximum security uh, prison in upstate New York to find out you know, what kind of rights uh, your uh, people, you know, uh, your prisoners uh, have. So they have everyday visitors. They're allowed six times a week to meet with their wives and they have family reunions twice, uh, 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 once every two months, six times a year. People whom I met there, they had, you know, some of them, two bodies behind, some had four bodies behind, they're killers. They had uh, 25 to life, 40 to life, 60 to life, and natural life. Navalny killed nobody. Navalny didn't do anything wrong except that he is an opponent to Mr. Putin. So my question to you, David, you understand that I understand, that they're going to kill him unless we get him out. Is there any chance? And I know that President Biden was very supportive when Navalny, you know, uh, when Navalny returned back to Russia after um, Putin tried to kill him. And he was immediately put in jail. 
I know that President Biden and, um, and uh, Secretary of State Blinken and his deputies, they were talking about Navalny at each and every meeting with Putin or his uh, uh, deputies. Now, do you think there is any possibility for the prisoners exchange like it happened in the Soviet times? You remember Natan Sharansky went through that, uh, Vladimir Bukovsky and so it goes. A couple of things. First, I don't, I wouldn't be too easy on the, without drawing any parallels and without excusing a thing, but let's remember uh, our incarceration levels in this country are gigantic and outsized. They've gotten a little bit better, but mar marginally so. And the conditions in a lot of those prisons, including Rikers nearby, are abysmal. I, it's not a, a way to morally or even conditionally compare with the with the Russian system, but I, I, it's important to point that out. It's it's not it's certainly not heavenly. Uh, far from it. I I think if you're saying that the U.S. is wrong to have a prisoner exchange about U.S. and Russians, you can say that, but I think it's going it, it, to that the U.S. is pursuing it very hard. I mean, I I think the spectacle, for example, of uh, Brittany Grenier and uh, languishing in prison uh, and now a penal colony for the possession of some tiny amount of, um, uh, it wasn't marijuana, but it was a hash oil. Hash yeah, it was, but it was oil or something. Yeah, um, is, is, you know, people know about that here. And um, if they can make a deal that they can swallow, they're gonna do it, independent of Navalny. I think rate, I, I, the idea that somehow the United States is going to exchange, get Russia to agree to exchange uh, anything that involves Navalny in the in near term, I just don't see it. I can't imagine it's on the political docket. Considering, considering Putin's political position now with Ukraine, he's gonna go out of his way to allow his main political opponent who who, who is, uh, would turn into the most vocal opponent of the war and of him, uh, that he would do that deliberately? I just, why would he do that, Jenya? How could he do that? I, I, I wish he would, I wish he'd do it yesterday. But just if you're trying to- Because he may get desperate. His, despera his desperation would lead him to, to, to release Alexei Navalny. I, Forgive me, you know these things better than I do, but I, I don't see it. I don't, I don't see why he would do that. To impress whom? To gain what? I, I just, that seems very, very unlikely to me. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, yes. Uh, and I should say, and I should say for those of you who don't know this, uh, Genia is a very close, not only a close friend of Navalny's, but a, an extremely loyal friend who's visited him repeatedly, and helped him immeasurably and asks no thanks for it. And so it's faster for me to say it than, than Jenny herself. Um, Alexei Navalny is extremely talented politician and he's our only help. <laughs> because Putin may want something from uh, President Biden because he may get desperate because you know he doesn't have his too many assets to trade for. So, this is all for the next. Okay. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I religiously read the New Yorker and do it both on paper and on my iPhone. And this is my, 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 my <laughs> subscriptions, of course. So, Only uh, in the New Yorker can you get dumb jokes like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> is there a red wave? No, there isn't. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But Barry Flynn is a kind of genius political um, cartoonist. God love him. You have a great app on iPhone. And whenever, you know, when I couldn't have access to the paper magazine, I read it, of course, you know, on my computer and my iPhone, etc. But I wonder when immediately when I got back to the States, mm -hmm. I resumed, you know, my paper edition, you know. We're old fashioned. But my question to you, 
How long do you think you, you, you will be able to come out on paper? <laughs> the answer to that depends not on you or me. It depends on you. It depends on you. In other words, we will be there for the audiences where they want us, right? I, I, it, I have to say, as somebody my age or what, I, I, I do think this is a pretty good technology. I think the phone is also a good technology and laptop is a good technology. I don't think broadsheet newspapers in the modern world is a great technology. And the market is telling me that I'm right. I don't go down the subway. I see this on the subway quite often. I never anymore see this. <laughs> I, I, no one. You, you probably don't even know how to do it. I mean, it's, it's the whole part, you know. Nobody under 40 knows how to do that. And why should they? Um, but they're reading the New York Times. They're just reading on their phone. And so what? The key thing is, the essential thing is, can we survive? And we damn well will. Can we survive as a, as a going concern economically and stick to our guns in terms of our level of quality, depth, beauty, humor, all the things we want to be. And if you insist that that only be on the phone, we're going to be there for you or on a laptop. Or if you make me broadcast it on the side of the Empire State Building, I'll do that. If that's what works, as long as it's beautiful, true, fact-checked, edited, and written at the highest level. That's the key. As long as we can maintain our values and sense of quality, how it gets to you. Um, I'm agnostic about it. I have my own personal preferences. I, you know, I don't read, uh, I don't read books on uh, on tablets, for example. Although I, I, you know, I'm starting to see the virtue in it because if I'm reading in bed, it's like if I'm reading a big fat book, it's like holding, it's like weightlifting. So it's probably <laughs> stupid. So I can change. But <laughs> you know, since I do read. And you for you, I now, a couple of issues ago, probably a couple of weeks ago, there was a feature story, probably 20, if not even 30,000 words long. Less than 30. Less than 30. <laughs> <laughs> On the leader of one African country who happened to be a Nobel Prize winner because he allegedly he ended the civil war in, in his country. Right. So to start a genocidal war against one of the tribes in his own country. And so, and I was reading and, and I, but I couldn't, I cannot imagine to read this on the iPhone just because how many screens do you need? And I was reading and reading and then finally I, I got uh, and I decided to see what is it there in the very end. Mm -hmm. So tell me, you know, how do you choose length and what kind of stories can be that long? <laughs> First of all, it wasn't 30,000 words. <laughs> it was 8,000 words. No, no, no. Julius. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm absolutely 100% right. Eight <laughs> tops nine. <laughs> this was about Africa, uh, the African nation of Ethiopia, not so small. And in fact, it, it had absolute access to its very complicated leader. This is John Lee Anderson. And the war, in fact, came to an end two or three weeks later. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, I'm being ridiculous. I, what, I, what I mean to say is, if you don't want to read it on the phone, Jenya, don't read. It. In other words, read it where it's udobna, where it's convenient to you. As and as our, I'm used to it now. I got used to it. I wasn't initially. I changed, and no one's asking you to. And I'm not being defensive about this. I just wanted to be available to our readers in the forms that they want it in. If that's a multiple sense of forms for this period for the next. X years, fine, that's what we're gonna do. And, you know, uh, that's the easy part. I mean, the biggest struggle for us, and it's different from the newspapers, the biggest struggle for us that took place over a period of years when the internet came along, a daily newspaper had all kinds of challenges where the internet was concerned, but in the end, the New York Times 
online was the same metabolism, a little bit speeded up during the course of the day. People, things land during the course of the day and maybe something that would come out on Sunday comes out on Tuesday, but it's more or less the same. You're getting the news, right? The New Yorker until, I don't know, 15 years ago, whatever it was, was the same thing every week. It was this, this print object that came out once a week. It was not especially concerned with what day you read it. If it was timely, it was timely in the sense that it was a certain subjects were in the air or cultural events were in the air, but it wasn't the daily news. We leave that to somebody else. All of a sudden we're presented with this technology that its greatest virtue is uh, speed and distribution, right? You couldn't, if you wanted the New Yorker <laughs> pre-internet, you had to be a pretty clever person to get it delivered to your door. You, you didn't know that many people who got the print New Yorker in Moscow. You just didn't. And if you got it in Paris where it was easier to get it, you got it a week late, two weeks late, three weeks late, and it cost a lot of money. Now you get it instantly, instantly. What was difficult for us to, was to figure out our identity online, what to do with this new um, uh, metabolism that had something to do with the New Yorker and not like some third rate version of the New York Times. We already have a first rate version of the New York Times. Didn't need a third rate version of it. So that kind of identity struggle was the source of and remains a constant conversation, argument, uh, source of meetings. And the same goes for audio video and all the other uh, technologies that are, are, are potentially creative and exciting. I just want them to all be at the level of the New Yorker at, at, on a moral sense and on a journalistic sense in terms of accuracy. Um, we had to figure out how to do the speed thing. That took a while. That took a while. Thank you very much. I understand that I already exceeded my limit. So now we have to, uh, I would like to uh, pick up your questions. And, you know, I have, you know, quite a few questions here on Zoom. So, but yes, please go ahead. Please uh, present me because I hate to talk to anonymous. Oh, okay. Anonymous. So please, name yes, Scott. your name. Okay. I, I worked for the Moscow Times. Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, here's here. Um, Shania, I'm, you mentioned the 1.2 million Russian suits left Russia. And um, I want to first of all, like, can you describe who, who this group of people is, what it means for the future of Russia, and also as, I don't know if you would identify as, as a member of that group, can you just reflect on what is, how do we make sense of the experience of this diaspora? Do you ever expect, for example, to go home? Uh, impossible question. Because I keep telling myself that by the end, at the end of the spring, I'm going to be home. My home is Moscow. I still, you know, just yesterday I was thinking, you know, wait a second, probably it was a mistake to leave. Yes, it was, it was getting risky. Yes, you know, there were, just today all of a sudden, uh, uh, once again, they, they fined me for 40,000 rubles. God, you know, another story, you know. Anyway, you know, I'm, uh, I just got uh, this uh, information letter from the Roscom not so. But anyway, uh, that's predominantly, you know, there are a lot of IT people, there are a lot of, you know, all, each and every newsroom left. But by the way, not just uh, Russian newsroom. When the war started, New York Times left, Sky News left, BBC left. Uh, Washington Post left. Uh, everybody left. Everybody left. Uh, ah, yeah, Josh. But Joshua was reporting from the front line. But yeah, yeah. But he moved to Ukraine and he reported from the front line. Right. Right. I, I and I had Joshua on my talk show from Moscow. Yes. Um. We. That's the estimate, of course. You know. There are a lot of journalists are in Riga and in Vilnius, that Baltic Republics, and you know, it's Lithuania and uh, Latvia, some of them in Estonia. Uh, a lot of people move to Kazakhstan, Georgia, and Armenia because they don't require visa, and now uh, Europe pr pretty much closed doors for Russians because they're afraid. 
and you know it's understandable given the history of of uh, those republics. But anyway, um, <laughs> still I'm not sure that you know I have uh, a couple of people who are still writing for the New Times uh, out of Russia. Uh, there was one, you know, my columnist, uh, uh, Andrei Kolesnikov, who doesn't censor himself, and he's still in Moscow. And of course, I'm terrified each time I put his column on the website or I have him on my YouTube show. So it's hard to make sense of that, because to be honest with you, I... Uh, I've been many times to the United States. I went to school here, you know, many times I was back and forth, back and forth. But I always knew that half a year from now, nine months from now, a year from now, I'm going to be back home. And now I don't. And that's why I keep telling myself, end of May, hopefully I will go back. I just have to think of that. Besides, don't forget, I have my friends who are sitting in jails. Alexei Navalny is a friend of mine. Ilya Yashin, just yesterday, you know, I wrote to him, you know, big, big letter analyzing the American elections because all of them, they're so interested the way it happens here. And uh, Vladimir Karamurza, who is facing uh, treason charges at 20 years, uh, and Mikhail Krieger, and uh, Alexander Gorin, and cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, but anyway, that's not my show. That's David's show. Please ask him questions. Okay, go ahead. Yes, please. Please. Yes. Can I ask a question? No, okay. don't ask me a question, please. <laughs> please. These are... Okay, so the, the, the question I would ask you is, um, so to, what do you think would constitute an adequate public discussion in the serious American press about the risks of nuclear escalation attending our involvement in this country? I think we're having it. I, 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 anytime you say the word conversation and risks of nuclear uh, accident, it sounds insane because it's so unthinkable. We've had nuclear accidents. We see the ramifications of them. You, you, you're referring to nuclear weapons. The risks of, an, of the escalation to a nuclear exchange. Well, I think, aren't we having that? I, I, haven't I heard that uh, numerous times? And, yeah, and my it, question to you is, do you what's think amazing, what's, a, what's amazing, is sometimes you hear the conversation on a, on, a, on a level of such calm that it's almost frightening. In other words, well, you know, tactical nuclear weapons, it really wouldn't kill that many people and it wouldn't leave the area lifeless for that long. I mean, it, it, we're at that level. I find that quite chilling. But what's equally chilling is what's actually happening right now that you don't need nuclear weapons to kill what, what's probably added up to close to 200,000 people. I think that's, well, I, I certainly in some. So I think we've had, I, I, unless I'm wrong, unless you're, I'm missing something, it seems to me that that conversation is being had. No? You think not? I mean, <laughs> Rather, hear what you think about not so much about the risks. How do we think clearly? I think the risk is that you're dealing with somebody who's utterly unpredictable, and this has proved his unpredictability and his his um, recklessness and v sense of unmitigated cruelty over and over again. Yes. Uh, the, Fourth row. Yeah, yeah, there's a little cluster. The woman, the woman in front of you, actually. And then I'll get you. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. Thanks so much. I'm Victoria Smolkin. I teach uh, Russian and Soviet history at Wesleyan. Hi. Hello. Um, so my question is, um, we were talking about, um, we introduced this idea of land for peace, mm. right, as a possible framing, as a resolution that's getting traction. Um, the question I have is, uh, is really appealing to your knowledge of the American establishment from the inside as they understand Russia. Mm. Um, Putin has made his intentions very clear, uh, in, and they are broader than, um, than Donbass, Crimea. They are actually um, on a kind of civilizational scale, right? So that's one. And so I guess the question um, 
and, and moreover, Putin is not a trustworthy um, interlocutor at this point. I think too that's many, fair to say. Too many um, deals have been made and, and broken. Um, so the question I have is, do you think there is a version of Russia as currently constituted with which it is possible to make peace? I, I, that's the you know, 64,000 ruble question. I, so far, no, because it all goes through one person. What, what is invis relatively invisible to us, although there are aspects of it that, that have become more visible than when Jenny and I had a, in an interview when she was in Moscow, I don't know how many months ago, six months ago. January 2022. Oh shit, it was that long ago. Okay, well. I you, where are they now? Yeah, so, and no, you interviewed me. I interviewed you after the war began and it was ah, pu published yes. online in the New Yorker. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, this is, this is the, this sense of mystery. You know the expression, those who don't know speak and those who know don't speak. And I think we should keep that in mind when we hear people say, Putin thinks this, Nodishkin is telling Putin that, he's isolated because of COVID and he's only hearing this. And I, I think this is all speculative um, uh, information, accent on the quote marks in the air. So I'd be very wary of speculating with a certainty about what Putin does or does not think or what Putin will or will not do in the near term. He likes it like that. But this is the price of the political system that he has taken great pains over time to establish. There's no, there's no feedback systems. This is the, this is the great horror of, of, of a highly authoritarian uh, system. And with, with the pandemic, uh, with uh, with all kinds of other political uh, events that we've seen over the over the previous years, is less and less and less feedback. There are fewer and fewer people that are in his inner circle of any reliability, uh, and certainly that we can rely on. I will say, and it's an interesting thing to note. I was once talking to a an inside person, a Russian person who really knows Russian things and is, was at that time in the government, high up. And this person said, you know, if truth be told, we, we know relatively nothing about North Korea. Very little. For all kinds of reasons. We know a lot about Russia. We know a lot about Russia. So American intelligence, Western intelligence was pretty good at predicting the war. You know that saga. Um, and you know the interplay with Ukraine as well, which was complicated. We know a lot, but there's a lot that we clearly don't know from day to day. I will say that there is stuff that comes out, in, at least in the, in the pop press, that just seems to me on this, on, uh, just nonsense. For example, counting on the notion that Putin has cancer or Parkinson's, he's going to die tomorrow, and he's, uh, it's, it's a chipucha. It's nonsense. So... Uh, I'd be very wary of, 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 of guessing, because that's all it is. Yeah, and the gentleman behind you. Yeah, um, we have to uh, grab a, a question from uh, Zoom. Yes. And here is, uh, you know, here is a question from Katrina Van den Hugh. Of course, you know, Katrina. Oh, Katrina Van yeah. Yes, the nation. And also, she's a widow of, uh, of the former uh, uh, professor here at NYU. So she asks, who are, David, who are Nina Andreeva has? Nina Andreeva's has. We have to explain. <laughs> That's here. I'm sorry. Yes. 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 Uh, so in the so-called golden era, there was in 1988, yeah. Yeah. A letter appeared as if by magic in a newspaper called Sovietska Rasia, which was thought to be more uh, traditionalist, shall we say, uh, more, less liberal than some of the other, and certainly was not like Moscow News or, or Literatura Nea Gazeta at that time, although these things have changed, a lot of them. The letter appeared in Sovietska Rasia called, I, I, I Will Not Betray Principles, I think was the headline. And it it was a conservative or even neo-Stalinist uh, rebuke of Gorbachevism. 
And it clearly had sponsors in the Politburo and Central Committee leadership that sanctioned the publication of this letter that was written by a, a uh, Communist Party loyalist and, and teacher named Nina Andreeva who lived at that time in what was then called Leningrad. Um, it was my great fortune to, I just, because, you know, I'm not, I'm not that smart, but I'm a reporter. So I just got on a train and I went, I knocked on the door of this woman, Nina Andreeva, and there she was. And we spent all the time in the world together. Good cook, I must say. <laughs> for a neo, for a neo Stalinist. Um, uh, no one's perfect. Um, and, th but this, this episode exposed for the first time, the rifts in the, uh, uh, Communist Party leadership. And it was thought that Yegor Ligachev, for example, was the sponsor of this letter uh, and so on. I, I think what Katrina is asking is um, who, who are, possibly who are the, the communist heirs. I, that I, I don't see. I don't see that the, that the politics of now has anything to do with communist no. ideology. Nina Andreeva was a a full-throated, I experienced it firsthand, full-throated uh, communist ideological loyalist. That's, that's who she was. Um, what I do sense in Russia, and, and Jenny will certainly tell me, I hope, when I'm wrong, not if I'm wrong, but when I am wrong, that, that there is, in the, both in the leadership and in the population, a ferocity of Russian nationalism that is, something to be extremely concerned about. And one of the things that the people who try to know what's going on in the leadership will say is that if Putin were to be hit by a car or die or overthrown, it's not as if he would be immediately replaced by uh, uh, the heirs of Alexei Navalny. It would be people who are more like the, the intelligence and security apparatus of of the Putinist system that's been built over time. I, I hope Katrina that answers your question. And if not, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about it later. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, there is another question that, you know, since we had already a couple from the audience, would you suggest that the war in Ukraine, uh, Andrei Gulin, uh, mm -hmm. would you suggest that the war in Ukraine will shake or strengthen the political regime inside Russia? It's already shaken the political, the, 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 um, the political regime inside Russia. I, we just don't, I, do, I just don't think we see it the way we would see it in a, um, a more transparent, uh, more easily reported on uh, society. I think it, this is evident. When you have Kadyrov saying the things that he's saying, and when you have Prigozhin, who couldn't be a, a more loyal uh, figure, being critical or openly frustrated, you're seeing fissures in, in the leadership that you would not have seen a year ago. I think that's pretty self-evident. I think this guy's been waiting very yeah, patiently. Thank you so much. Um, a while back, you mentioned the kind of fantastical thinking that allowed Putin to enter Ukraine, mm -hmm. expecting to find a passive um, population um, who would yeah, not resist. I'm wondering what... Um, Could have been done. I don't know. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could talk about kind of the political or cultural context that allowed that delusion to begin and take hold and go uncontested um, up to the doorstep of the invasion. I think there's a human, a very human um, desire and reflex to not believe that the worst is going to happen. We, most dramatically, we see this with climate change, collectively, globally. There's a kind of Let's all hold our hands, close our eyes, and try to forget this is going to happen because to, to stave it off or even to ameliorate it is just too costly, too destabilizing, uh, and too much of a pain in the ass to, to, to deal with. There, there is this human reflex. And to, you know, today at lunch, uh, I went to Columbia University, and there was, the John Chancellor Award was given to Masha Gessen. And not unlike Zhenya Albatz, who's been writing about the KGB for, I don't know, 30 years and telling us some very scary things, I know repeatedly 
that when Masha Gessen would write something seemingly outrageous about the course of Putinism, or Genia Albatz would write early on about the degree to which the uh, security establishment was not only reestablishing itself, but becoming the, uh, the true elite of the country and, 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 and aggrandizing itself in the financial sense as well as in its power, people didn't really want to believe that in every quarter. It, there's a very human desire not to believe the worst thing possible could happen because it's very hard to live that way. And that leads to some uh, very often some foolish thinking. And we're all guilty of it. Yes. yes. Uh, yep. uh, ah. There is a question uh, now from Zoom and uh, there is Catherine Fitzpatrick, great translator. She was translator of my book, by the way. Is Russian, from, from Russian into English, she's a great translator. Is Russian civil society worth saving given it could not stop or effectively protest the war in Ukraine? And she also says, does it mean um, to hope in such figures as Marina Sianikova or, or, or Alexei Venediktov if, if, if those such as Alexei Navalny remain in jail? <laughs> well. I, this is this gets to what we were talking about before uh, that civil society in Russia sat alongside of authoritarian Russia. That that was the condition I think of the last years, um, which was so in many ways unique and new and comfortable and dangerous. So on the one hand, you had Dorscht and Echo Moskvi new times, restaurants, um, cool jobs, traveling, you know, the internet, all kinds of things that signaled that life was now better, freer, and more prosperous if you were lucky enough to be in a certain class. And, and there were certain freer medias for certain audiences. Echo was certainly freer, although it reached, I think we could argue, and concede an older audience, an older liberal audience, Dosh reached a younger audience. Certain things online reached an even younger audience. That was civil society. Those were the seedlings of civil society, but it existed alongside of authoritarian, uh, an increasingly authoritarian uh, uh, Putin uh, system. It's important to say a system created around him, for him, and answerable all to him, which is a remarkable thing. So if the question is, is Russian civil society worth saving given it could not stop or effectively protest the war in Ukraine, what's the alternative? What's the alternative? I think, you know, I, I have any number of friends like Eugenia who are here, you know, the expression here, but not here. They're here, their asses are in the chair, their minds are elsewhere three quarters of the day. They want to go home, just as I would want to go home. Their, their, their psychological life, their, their political yearnings, their hopes for the future, their hopes for their children do not reside in Greenwich Village. They reside in on Katusovsky Prospect or wherever you happen to live in, 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 in whatever place. So of course I think it's worth saving and um, one can only hope and one can only fight for, uh, uh, whether as a journalist or an activist or a student or whoever you happen to be, um, a, a better future for Russia and for Ukraine. We've talked an awful lot about you, Russia today, and it shouldn't be forgotten that the true damage in the immediate sense, the, 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 the death count, um, uh, the ruination of, a, of the infrastructure of a nation is in Ukraine, in Ukraine. Yeah. Hi, my name is Maud. I'm a grad student from IR here at NYU. Hi, Maud. Hi. Uh, as a person under 40, I really enjoy the New York Times Daily podcast. <laughs> and uh, last week, they mentioned uh, we see that a crucial turning point is that Putin now has asked parts of the population that has no too little military training to join the oh, forces. God. Do you 
I think you imagine yourself a parent of a 25 year old grocery clerk or construction worker or hospital attendant who one day is told to get on a bus and three days later, somebody's gonna put a rifle in your hands or put you in a tank and you're in the middle of Ukraine. And five days after that, it's very likely that you'll be sent home in a box. Imagine you're the parent in that circumstance and what your attitude toward the Russian state is going to be, even though you've been told for a year and more that this is a righteous special military operation, that Ukrainians are our brothers and sisters, if only they would knuckle under. Uh, it's quite possible that that could change your view of the world and your view of the view of your government and the view of your dictator, I think. And I think we've seen that phenomenon because you have seen street demonstrations, not necessarily in Moscow, on, you know, Pushkin Square or uh, on, on Nevsky Prospekt, but you've seen them in the, in provincial towns and cities. Again, not hundreds of thousands of people, but the courage that it takes for anybody to come out for 15 minutes, it is always in my mind, the, the exemplary moment of, of moral courage or one of them in Russian history takes place in August, uh, 1968. What happened? The Soviet Union had just invaded Prague, Czechoslovakia to crush the Prague Spring to in, in effect kidnap the leadership of, of Czechoslovakia and bring them to the Kremlin and to um, reform them. Eight people, eight went to Red Square, eight Russian intellectuals, the, the, the absolute cream of the Russian intelligentsia, one of them pushing a baby carriage, a poet, uh, uh, you know, th this kind of milieu, eight people, they went to Red Square, they came out with, with uh, signs, placati, uh, you know, signs. And they said things like, you know, we are with the Czechs, you know, down with the Kremlin, that kind of thing. Within, within not minutes, but seconds, uh, KGB officers, KGB people who were on the square guarding Red Square were all over them and beat the hell out of them. And off they went to various, uh, uh, phony trials and then prison. The whole thing took at most five minutes. This was the birth, the birth in many ways of what was then the modern dissident movement. It's, there certainly had been aspects of it before in Sinyavsky and Danielle and all, all kinds of things. That moment of courage by eight people, you could argue without exaggeration, led to the birth of a dramatic dissident movement, or it sparked it. So when I see a hundred mothers go out into the city square of some provincial town in, uh, in Russia, that has meaning because it represents far more than that hundred people. So I think, I think what was being said uh, on that radio program is, and that podcast is, is, has real force. Yeah, David, thank you so much. This has been amazing. My pleasure. Um, I want to try to combine two questions into one, although it might end up being. And by the way, somebody, as soon as you've really had enough, wave your hands or <laughs> grab your throat or something like that. I'm mindful of that. Go ahead. And I want to pick up on two things you said. One is, I think, actually, quite, there's a quite, quite similar take from political science would say that if Putin is likely to be exited out of power right now, it's going to be not necessarily from the right, but from the elites, as opposed to a mass uprising. And that that's a common phenomenon and that in these kinds of circumstances, that looks like the more likely scenario. But you also had this very interesting insight where you talked about the deal, right? The Putin era deal of what you get in return for staying out of politics, which had a certain feel to 1970s Eastern Europe as well. And so that's something that a lot of us have talked about. And I, well, what I'm interested in your take on this in particular, given your sort of long history with Russia and the sort of holistic view of Russia, and 
in-depth journalism that we, you know, we get out of the New Yorker. You mentioned that that deal was a deal for the middle class in the cities. And so my question is, what is the result going to be longer term for those who haven't left? I mean, we know what the immediate result was. A lot of people left. Yeah, but it's a, if it if, if in fact, and I don't doubt Jenya, that it's a million two. Right, there's still a lot left. It's a nation of how many? 144. Yeah, 144 million so the, people. So my question is, what's going to be the result on the people who were the benefactors of that deal, the middle class who were enjoying that that you now said is over? And then could I, you I don't know that it's over. That? I don't know that it's oh, over. Oh, I thought that's what you said. That I think that, that you said now it's over for now. Well, that's for sure. Yeah. It's over for now. If you can contrast that with how that's being interpreted by the people who were maybe not the benefactors of that deal previously, the ones who didn't get to go to Cyprus and who didn't send their kids abroad and who didn't live in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you can tie that a little bit in to this question of public support for, for Putin. Like, and, and it's different from the question we've been talking a lot sure. about right now which is what's the effect of the mobilization. That I think is clear, and we understand that throughout the country- yeah, But it's critical. Generate pushback. But I'm talking longer term. I understand. If that world's over, where, you know, where does this leave us, and what's the differentiation between the middle class and the rest of the country? Well, look, most people, and it's important for a lot of us, myself very much included, are to remember that most people don't follow politics in an intense way uh, all the time. So even in this country, with, a, with, a, with all its flaws, a free press, the, the numbers of people who watch MSNBC, CNN, and even Fox uh, are minuscule, minuscule. The New York Times is right now on a great ride of, expo of, of explosion in terms of its subscription base. And, it, and it's, it's, it's going to you know, get out the party hats when it reaches 10 million. But again, we're in a country of 330 million people. Most people, not or not everybody, follows news and the details of these things as intensely as possible. And while there was no red wave you know, in the elections here, it is still true that things like inflation, uh, the ability to fill up your gas tank, uh, safety in, in, in schools and on the streets, uh, however you want to argue about these issues, these so-called kitchen table issues are essential, essential. Not everybody in 1970 was arguing about the war in Vietnam. There, are, there were other issues. There was, there was a, a life that went on from, for, for many people. But that was the days when there was not a professional army and the war came home. You remember these films that you'd, you'd see like The Deer Hunter, for example, where the war would come home to uh, a small town in, I believe, you know, rural Pennsylvania, and it had an explosive effect, but it took time. It didn't happen right away. And the war is clearly coming home in Russia, even inside of a year. And so the effects, I think, are seismic. I don't, we're not talking about everybody worried about restaurants or the ability to read, um, you know, Vasily Grossman or, 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 or even listen to Shania Albats on, on, on Echo Moskvi. Thank you for putting me yeah. in the center. Uh, <laughs> I've seen Vasily Grossman. You're not so bad yourself. And so, but the war has comes home in different ways. The way it's coming home in the provinces is that reality is starting to see past these, these propagandistic systems that are in place. The truth is, is getting there. I'm not saying it's, it's all there. And I think to live inside of a uh, unfree uh, land like Russia where the media is concerned is something that we can't imagine. It's really hard to imagine where all of television is saying one thing where the internet is affected even, and that's the hardest thing to control, uh, where certainly publications, you know, New Times, which, you know, forgive me, never had a gigantic uh, 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 circulation, but nor did Echo Musk, we have a gigantic uh, uh, listenership either. But to have that eliminated 
and have the so-called debate shows on, on state television be everybody saying the same thing. You, it, it, I don't think that's imaginable for us. As banal as some of our media is, as flawed as some of our media is, that kind of system is very hard for us to imagine what it's like to live inside of. So to see that penetrated and to see the cracks in the wall of this because of the realities of the war is significant. May I ask you, since you know all of red uh, plot against America, do you think- The plot against America, the yes. Philip Roth, no. Philip Roth, mm -hmm. Do you think it's plausible in this country? Uh, of course I do. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but it, it, it damn well, to some degree happened. I, 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 I've been wrong about some big things, but one thing I wasn't wrong about was Trump. And, and I'm not the only one, by, please. I, but I, but I, I'll, on the night of, in November in 2016, I went to an election night party um, because I thought of, you know, all our pieces are all ready to go to be posted on the internet, first woman president. <laughs> and like an idiot, I hadn't, we, we hadn't prepared the alternative the way you would normally would. Um, and at around, what, nine o'clock Eastern Standard Time, things started to go a very different way. And I had had, uh, you know, an adult beverage or so, and and I happened to have a laptop with me. I rarely do. Usually I have my phone, but I had a laptop and I'm at this party. And I went off into a corner in the kitchen. There's like 60, 70 people around. And I wrote this piece called An American Tragedy. A really, really dark piece, which just shows I, I can't drink. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, unfortunately, everything in it came true and then some, and then some. You know, to, in those days, in 2016, we were still making fun of his hair color, like if, as if this, or, or, or his, you know, exaggerations. It wasn't a lot of people using words like authoritarianism or the potential for neo-fascism or many other things. All of that came true. All of that came true. So. Um, and it could have gotten a lot worse if he had been reelected because of course he would have been less restrained, more surrounded by even deeper lunatics. Um, and who knows where it could have gone. Right, but they, so can it happen? Because... Yes, democracy is incredibly fragile. It can also be exploited. History has shown us that over and over again. But the, in the universe of the plot against America, mm. Trump was get for election. He was doomed to get for election. Yeah. So how really was the margin so great? How many votes, how many popular votes did did, did, did Biden win by? A couple of million? Yeah. Population of Queen? Seven million. Okay. Seven. Population of New York City. Less than the population. It's significant. But if, if there hadn't been a pandemic, maybe it would have gone a different way. In other words, we live in history. We don't live in, in, you know, we live with existential questions around us about democracy, about the air we breathe and the earth we walk on. These are ex extraordinarily consequential issues and they can go either way. They can go either way. History proves that. It gets me to, you know, to the question that, you know, once again, we come back to the golden years of Russian and probably world history, because it was the end of the Cold War, and, you know, it was like, a, we all felt like, you know, we're going to have, you know, this happy, happy life ahead of us, and, you know, all our dreams are going to come true. The end of, of the, the, young, the, true. the end of history. Yes, we were young. The end, yeah. the end of history, right. right. The great success, you know, the victory of uh, liberal. I, but I don't, I mean, since you paid so much money to get in, I, I do want to assure you <laughs> that good things can happen too, right? I mean, it, it is possible 
that the poison of Trumpism can fl be flushed out. I mean, in 2008, a lot of voters who voted for Trump voted for Barack Obama. And twice, twice, he won in Ohio. Where, I mean, he, he won in unexpected places. A African-American liberal um, of immense talent, political talent, uh, won the popular vote and the electoral vote by significant margins. So um, I wouldn't rule out possibility either. The, the problem is, is that Trump, which may have been a, in many ways a reaction to the Obama years, um, ripped open and exposed some of the worst uh, tendencies in American life and American history, which never really go away, but he made them all the worse. Um, and Trumpism is exploiting them as well. How about this is the last question, or, or I'm going to be you got you have to be dead. Yeah. Um, just pertaining to your last comment. Sure. Last week is, is 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 what it was, but there were over 150 election deniers elected to yeah. federal office, and now the House is controlled by a party uh, whose majority voted to not certify last year's election. Um, essentially voting with the insurrectionist, including Mike Pence's own brother. Um, oddly enough. So it seems to me maybe we're, we're not out of the woods or, or, or where are we now? Um, I think you're 100% right. I think you're 100% right. I, I don't know what more to add to that, that um, how many of these election deniers were sincere or how many of them were just figured that, well, that's what I have to say in order to get this cool job which is a lot better than being at home and, and selling, you know, whatever, whatever their job was before. Um, people sell themselves cheap sometimes. And um, it's just a tragic truth. I, you know, look at Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell wanted two big things. He wanted right-wing judges and lower taxes. And in order to get it for years, he sold his soul to not say anything true about Donald Trump. It's not as if he didn't know. It's not as if he didn't leak to certain to a certain degree his his contempt so that he could have it both ways. But he wanted those two things, and he wanted power above all. Well, so I, it's um, so when something like eight, 1989 does happen, and there are political actors of integrity and creativity uh, like Gorbachev. Um, and he was hardly alone, like Sakharov, in a different way. Uh, and even for a while, people uh, in the Yeltsin camp, and we can have that argument too, uh, we should be looking square at them too as in terms of their possibilities. They're not perfect. They have all kinds of flaws. Gorbachev did, certainly Yeltsin did. Uh, Sakharov, I'm not quite sure what flaws he had, other than he died too soon. Um, so I, I, again, I think things turned out better than we might have thought, um, but you're 100% right. So with that, can I do this? I want to thank Jenya Albots for everything she's done for years and years. Thank you very much. Amazing. And it was a great, great uh, interview. Thank you very much for doing this and thank you for giving that much time. And most important, thank you for doing this. Because for me, if, you know, I, I don't have any sense of stability. I live in between countries. My home is uh, eight, uh, 10 hours flight from here. But this is my sense of stability because what, no matter where I am, in, on which continent, each week, I read the New York. Thank you so much. And thank you very much all. Thank you very much all for coming. And so next uh, series, uh, Fiona Hill. Oh. December 7, Fiona Hill. Oh, nobody says no to <laughs> Okay. Yeah, December 7th, everyone. I would love to. No, Jack Sullivan. I would love to interview Jack Sullivan. Uh, He's not going to say no to you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know.
December 7th, everybody. Yes. Thursday, December 7th. At 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Fiona Hill here. So join us. Thank you so much. Thank you.